So, first of all, apologies, because I know most of you were in the previous session, so you're going to hear some stuff again. Well, this has been recorded, so we need to bear in mind that, you know, we, we want to ensure that we're, we've given the same messages out um, um, on this. So, my name's Ian Scala, and I chair, in inverted commas, like I said last time, the uh, Mainframe Skills and Learning Group. Um, the reason for the inverted commas is just because, you know, we don't, I need to do a little bit better, um, not do everything at the last moment. Um, and these new people are going to help me to, to do that from the skills and learning group because I think there's a lot more we can do. Um, and so, as a brief introduction, the focus of last year, um, of our mainframe skills and learning group last year, was around establishing mainframe degree apprenticeships. And we set ourselves some really challenging targets to do that. So we were still talking about it at Easter time. And the universities obviously need to set their, to get all their um, agenda um, programs, and syllabuses, that's the word I'm looking for, syllabuses and things in place, but they have to have sign offs and all of this sort of thing. It was very, very aggressive. And I said, we were still talking about it at Easter um, and we're still evolving it, but that's the way apprenticeship schemes are supposed to work. It's about, it's a partnership. So we work at the university and and we come to to something you know we, we talk about it we we do agilely and and we we get to a position where we've got something that works and we're continuously continually reviewing it so next year we're going to apply learning from this year and we'll make it even better next year so um but basically we have made it a reality um mmu are now delivering a mainframe degree apprenticeship um, these three people here are three of the 19 people we have on, from a Barclays perspective, have on that course. They're learning COBOL. Um, so it's the first time in a long time that any university has been has taught COBOL or even acknowledged probably that it still exists. Um, despite the millions of code that we have out there, but I'm preaching to a converted here, so <laughs> I, won't, I won't go on too much about that. So, yes, we have made it a reality. Within Barclays, um, it is definitely a collaborative approach of, with, it, with MMU. I need to emphasise that because we, we just haven't handed it over to MMU and said, go and teach these guys COBOL, go and teach them some mainframe things, and then um, we don't do anything. It's, it's definitely a two-way um, process. It takes a lot of support within a bank. Um, we've tried to make it a success by... I suppose creating a culture within within the mainframe area that, that you guys need to start to develop the next set of um, the next generation of people and they take it seriously and, and they see that as part of their actual um, roles and, and that's really key to the to the success because it isn't just well it isn't me that much at all anymore but um, it's not it's not a, a small number of people, it's the entire mainframe team within Barclays, both on the application and the infrastructure side, which is key to, to the success of this. So we're going to hand over to, 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 to Robin first. So Robin from, from MMU, um, and we're going to, this session is more about how we made it a success from a, from a university perspective. Mm. Uh, welcome. Thank you for inviting us. Um, so uh, my name is Robin Johnson uh, and uh, I'm the programme director and what that really means is uh, that I was the person that drove it through the university systems and, and developing it. Um, I certainly didn't anticipate being in front of a, a bunch of mainframe experts uh, <laughs> at any time in my, uh, in my career. Um, the last time I touched a mainframe was when I first left school as a, as a computer operator for uh, uh, nine months. Um, I'm going to do the, the general introduction to um, how degree apprenticeships work and how ours looks and how we've turned, uh, adapted it to, to work for mainframes. Elaine, my colleague, is, is going to talk about um, the COBOL in particular um, because that's the specialist bit that the um, apprentices are doing in the first year. Um, but before that, um, we would like the, the three apprentices that we have here just to say a few words about their experience of it. And I know I'm aware some of you may have heard this in the previous session, but we want to just try and summarise that briefly so that we've got it uh, on video. So if you guys want to. 
Thank you. Um, I'm Harriet Davey. This is Karen Powell and Dan's behind me. Dan yep. Atherton. Um, again, sorry if this is repeated stuff, but um, we just wanted to give a bit of background in terms of context as, uh, as individuals, how we started our journey with Barclays and MMU. So um, I came from, uh, finished my A-levels and I did a year in as an apprentice with a company called McCann, who were a marketing firm. Um, I studied in MVQ in digital marketing. I just didn't, found that I didn't find that I was stretched at all, didn't find that I was challenged at all. So I started looking for um, things that were a bit sort of bigger than the MVQ I was doing. Obviously, that led to um, a degree being the next step. And then I found Barclays were offering one um, with MMU, which was close to home, convenient, and a university I'd heard of. So um, it all sort of fell into place, really. Uh, so I've, my name's Dan, I've just came straight out of A-levels, I've done a lot of IT and computing before this and I never really enjoyed full-time education and I really wanted to get straight into the workplace but I still had lots to learn to actually make that a reality. So this degree apprenticeship is really the best of both worlds, I still have that learning from the experts at uni and then I'm working full-time at Barclays the rest, of the rest of the week. So it's just been really the perfect opportunity for me and yeah, I'm really happy with the road ahead of me. Yeah, so uh, I'm Kieran. Uh, I'm a bit different. I was a ski instructor before I started on Barclays journey, um, but I was doing a lot of the IT stuff for the company, so I kind of did a bit of everything. I was doing a lot of the network stuff and that sort of thing, and uh, wasn't very good at any of it. So I've started here um, and kind of learned quite a lot already, I guess. Um, and I think because I had an attitude of having to do everything and get it done myself, I kind of brought that to Barclays and carried that on. Um, I think what we just want to talk about briefly is kind of how we found the apprenticeship so far um, and the support that we've kind of needed. So I think it's really, really key that when, when we started, we kind of, it wasn't you went Barclays one day a week and, oh no, Barclays four days a week and to uni for a day a week. It was very much integrated. So our whole time we spend at work, our first few months have been training so far. We've been training in work and that's linked into the training that we've done at uni. So. You know, we've got mentors and support people that have helped us um, and they, they link and talk and they come into, into work and they kind of, and into uni and help us a lot with that. Yeah. Our main sort of message we wanted to get across was any businesses who were thinking of getting involved in um, a degree programme, which is some fantastic opportunity both for, for a business and for obviously young people. Um, it's more a case of it does work in practice. Uh, we've had a lot of support. We've got many mentors and obviously people that came to the presentation before know there's a lot of support I kept going on about that. Um, but it, it, it really has helped because it's not, they're not two different things. Um, we were speaking before, it's not a sort of I'm a student on a Monday and, and I work in the week. It, it's, they come together and, and that, that's really helpful because it just means that within work expectations and uni expectations, they all come together. Um, we, just, we all keep saying that we, we know the road ahead and we know where we're going, which is really important. Um, four years might seem like a long time, but in, in terms of how it's been broken down and, and the training and the support that we've received, uh, it's not sort of a daunting road, which, which is really key um, in terms of this being a success um, definitely has um, from the offset. So a bit of background as well. We've been in Barclays for only three months. So it is very initial perceptions. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think there's one of the final points I'd like to make is we all come from different backgrounds and different walks of life. But I think because a lot of people don't really know what mainframe is, they don't really realize how accessible it is for young people. And a lot of people don't really know it's a fantastic option. And now that I know it, I'm definitely going to try and promote it as being that, well, the fantastic opportunity it is. Yeah. Okay. And just to, just to give that w one minute more extra context, <laughs> um, so that you understand why we've done things around COBOL and stuff, what we're trying to do within the bank is to basically emulate mainframe careers as they used to be 20, 30 years ago, where people started off as an application programmer, um, some people stayed in application programming, some people decided they wanted to go into program design, some would go into systems programming, and that's what we're trying to emulate as part of the degree apprenticeship scheme over a four-year period of time. So none of these guys have been given um, permanent homes yet, so but they're, they're allocated to teams who will move around, but we've not done as similar to, to other apprentices, such as like Connor who sat here, where we, where we said Connor's obviously assistance programmer, we put him in the assistance programming team, despite not understanding anything about what it was. We're trying to try, we've evolved the process 
and we're very much um, developing them as mainframe people and at some point in time they will be allocated into teams um, you know, they will get an input to that, we will get an input to that as, as a business, but nothing's been decided as, as to which teams that, that they go into. And that's why we're looking at COBOL, because that's a fundamental part of application programming. Um, and, you know, that's just to give you that, that extra context behind it. So, Lando, it's loving you shut up now. <laughs> Do you guys want to take a seat? Because otherwise yeah, sure. you're going to get... <laughs> OK. Um... The only thing I would, would say before I start the official talk is um, I think you probably get a sense of uh, what apprentices are like. Um, if I took three of my full-time first-year students and stood them up here in front of you and got them to talk to a professional audience, you would not get that same sense of confidence and purpose and intention. Um, what we find is that the apprentices are quite distinctive from our normal students that, that, that come through the university. They do have that sense of purpose and, and very quickly de develop a, a sense of, sort of self-confidence and, and over, well, they exceed uh, our full-time apprentices quite substantially in terms of achievement. So their average marks will be 10, 12, 15% above the average marks of our full-time students. So we're dealing with quite an unusual and exceptional kind of bunch of people. They're, they're blushing now, just in case you didn't realize. Um, so um, what Elaine and I want to talk about is I want to give you a bit of background to the degree apprenticeship. I want to talk about something called the apprenticeship standard because that's quite key to understanding how apprenticeships work. Uh, I want to show you quite briefly the, the breadth of the program structure that we run for our apprenticeship um, because it's important to understand that in order to see how mainframe fits into the general pattern. Um, I just want to raise one or two things that are um, relevant and important to companies that might be considering this. Things like confidentiality, how, how assessment in the workplace is handled um, and the role of the managers and mentors within the company. Um, and then, uh, lastly, just pick up uh, the, the stuff about reviews and, and um, port e portfolio that we use. After that, Elaine is going to talk about um, how we run the first year unit on COBOL, which, of course, is the, the, the kind of the, um, the tailored part of the first year, tailored to mainframe. Um, I'll skip through this quite quickly. The, the Manchester Met obviously based in Manchester, very big university, 37,000 students, um, impressive large number of buildings, huge range of students, courses, um, and uh, quite importantly for us, we were very um, quick out of the blocks with apprenticeships. So um, our vice chancellor likes to go around the, the, the country telling everybody that uh, Manchester Met has 15% of the, the country's apprentices all at Manchester Met. Um, and I don't know whether that's still true because it's, it's spreading like a cancer across the country. You know, um, when we started our digital um, apprenticeship, we were one of only six universities and now I think there are 25 universities actually offering it. So it's, it's spreading very rapidly and growing. Um, uh, and I'm sure we're not the only ones that are making a success of it, but we are making a success of it. Um, and the, the, the motivation of this obviously came from government, but, but it's been driven by the businesses. Um, so Manchester Met has great facilities. The, the apprentices here will tell you about them if... if you want to, you know, it's the business school is more like walking into a corporate building. It's it's concrete and steel and and um, glass and and lots of very nice open rooms. Um, it's very professional, um, and I think that's useful because it sets the context and uh, the expectation for our apprentices. So on to the degree apprenticeship. The important thing is that this is a work-based learning course. Um, People have sort of said to me, well, this is just like the well, kind of HNCs that we were teaching 20 years ago or whatever. It's different. And it, the reason it's different is, is the, the connection between the workplace and the, the degree. So, um, sure, we have assessments um, and we have to make a decision about what grade the, um, the apprentices will be awarded in their apprenticeship. But we work much more closely with the, the companies than we ever did when we ran HNCs and things like that. Um, and there's a much closer connection between what the apprentices are learning and what they're doing in the workplace. 
Um, one of the slightly anomalous and unusual things about this as a degree is that the apprentices are assessed in two ways. They're assessed from our point of view in terms of will they get a degree and, and what classification will that be? And that, that's, they're assessed in much the same way as, as they would be if they were on a standard degree. But they're also then assessed in terms of completing their uh, apprenticeship. And the world of apprenticeships talk about endpoint assessments, EPAs. Um, and oftentimes those are done by a third party on behalf of the, the training provider. Uh, in our case, we're actually doing it ourselves, um, but it has to be somebody who's independent within the university, somebody who has not been involved with our apprenticeship. But they are assessed on a piece of work and then a professional discussion um, at, at the end of their degree, after they've completed their degree, um, in order to decide whether they have completed the apprenticeship successfully. And only after they've gone through that do they actually get awarded the apprenticeship. Um, while they're on that journey through, though, the, the assessments will tend to be um, fall into to probably two categories. And, and one of those is a kind of real skills-based type stuff, which is, um, you know, if they're learning a, a programming language, then it's unlikely to be heavily work-based. It will be uh, a task that we've set them. Um, but where it's not a skills-based course, where it's maybe learning something about business or project management or uh, something like that, then they will be asked to go back into the workplace and, and find out about, investigate, evaluate, and analyze things that are going on in the workplace and write about that. Um, so there's, there's kind of two parts to it, and that's where the kind of work-based bits come in. They come in by supporting the skills that they're going to be using in the workplace, but they also come in by actually directing them at looking at the business and, and how the business is operating and writing about that in the context of best practice within the industry. So the, the apprenticeship is, is based on um, something called the apprenticeship standard. And I'll show you on the next slide, I'll show you what that looks like. But essentially, the apprenticeship standard defines the scope of the the degree it defines the scope of the learning that's got to take place on the degree. Um, and it was created and driven by a bunch of employers. So there was a, a consortium of probably started off as about 15, but finished at more like sort of 30 employers who were on a phone conference every Thursday morning for a couple of hours, working out what needed to be in there and, and kicking it around and uh, negotiating about it. And everybody had their own point of view. But the fairly quickly a consensus came through. And one of the things that was important about that was that virtually all the employers involved in those early days um, decided they wanted a broad-based curriculum. So we are not in the business of training very specific uh, skills. So the business analysts still have to use, learn about networks. The project managers still have to learn how to program. Um, so it's broad-based and... and um, Although there have now become some, some specialist um, apprenticeships in, in technology, this one, which is the main one, is, is very broad-based. So it includes all the kind of main areas you'd imagine. And we think about it in terms of two different parts. We think about it in terms of the core skills and knowledge. Um, and those, if you like, tend to be the foundations that you would expect of uh, an IT professional. And then we think about the specialist skills and knowledge and the specialist skills and knowledge are the things that dictate which pathway so there are something like eight or nine pathways they can do so that those range from business analyst and IT consultant through um, software engineer uh, cyber security analyst um, uh, data analytics also a whole range of things and it's the specialist skills that they learn which dictate the pathway that they get awarded at the end. Um, and for, for the mainframe, what we're dealing with is a, a specialist version of software engineer. So we didn't actually, there isn't a, a mainframe specialism that's defined by the, the standard. But what we, when we looked at it, what we realized was that we could adapt the software engineering um, by um, in some cases, making very, very minor changes. And in other cases, I think we'll have to make more substantial changes. But essentially, the mainframe will be a specialist version of the software engineer. 
The other thing that the early employers decided was that apart from the, the core foundations and the specialist skills, particular to the pathway, they also wanted to make sure that the apprentices came out as more rounded with a good set of, of interpersonal skills and professional skills that they understood about teamwork, they understood how teams work, how to get the best out of people, they, they uh, developed some sort of leadership skills um, and that's an important part certainly of our course. So the apprenticeship standard, I said I'd show you some of this, I've just lifted um, four of things, the key down the things, that's core skills, core technical knowledge, specialist um, skills and specialist knowledge. So you can see for specialist knowledge for software engineers is how to perform functional and unit testing. Um, specialist skills produce high quality code with sound syntax in at least one language following best practices and standards. And the core stuff, systems development, analyzes business and technical requirements. To, you can read it. Those are fairly typical of the sorts of things that you find defining a, a kind of degree level course. Um, there's about 55 of them for the, for the digital um, apprenticeship and what universities have to do is to actually design a, course, design a course which satisfies all of those things. I was going to show you um, this short video, is two or three minutes, interviewing both apprentices and staff at the BBC, um, but uh, I don't think it's going to, it's not going to run. Um, something about the way it's been put onto this computer means I can't actually run it. Um, but I think you've got better than that anyway, because we've got real apprentices here in the audience uh, and their managers. Um, so a bit of bit of background. Um, we've been going since 2015, so um, these apprentices that here are in their um, first year, but we've got two cohorts behind that. Um, Hannah sitting next to them is in the, the middle cohort, and then we've got some guys that are on their third year. Um, we've now got more than 250 apprentices, so it's been very successful. We started off with 60 in the first year, and last year we recruited 150. There's lots of enthusiasm for, for both from companies and from apprentices, um, and if you're thinking about doing it, you should go for it because it, it will be um, an easy journey, I think, both to a, recruit good people, um, but also to achieve good things. As I said at the beginning, they're a very high achieving bunch. They're averaging 70%. Oh, that's a first class degree. That's the average. Um, that's, that's way above what our normal students would be expecting to average. Um, and we've had very high retention rates, so we haven't had anything like the normal kind of dropout rates that we would expect from students. It's great. Um, we've had a few students recognised in national awards, and in fact, this slide's slightly out of date. We've had, as well as Nadia there, who was nominated for a young woman engineer by, on the IET, uh, James, who got an award for being best apprentice, but we've also actually, on the National Apprenticeship Awards, uh, one of our students uh, won the North West and will now go forward to London in January to, uh, for the National Apprenticeship of the Year. Apprentice of the Year. Um, and as I kind of mentioned uh, in the previous talk, we've, we've got well above average enrolment for women on a technology or computing-based course, which is very encouraging. Uh, and I think that's partly about having big companies involved because women see that there's flexibility and options in the big companies. Um, and also, this is a, a, on a pragmatic note, um, I think sometimes the women are more pragmatic than some of the lads and, and see the benefits of um, having a, a course, a degree that's funded and um, going to return, give you a salary. So currently what we offer at MMU is software engineering, IT consultants, uh, which is a bit of a misnomer. You probably want to think of that as just a general broad-based business technology degree. Um, there's not a huge expectation that the guys graduating from that are going to go straight into IT consultancy, although we do have some from um, kind of consultancy t companies, but we also have people in project management and general kind of business areas who are doing the IT consultancy route. Um, we've, last year, we started data analytics and cybersecurity, and cybersecurity in particular has proved very popular. Um, I think it's very attractive for the apprentices, but also as a number of companies want that as well. 
Um, and then this year we started the software engineering mainframe option. The way we run it is at four years, um, which is pretty standard for degree apprenticeships. Um, we have day release, and I think that's probably the best option. Some people are running it in block release or distance learning mode, but the great thing about day release is that you do get face-to-face -face contact with your tutors once a week, and that maintains a bit of momentum um, and keeps things progressing along. Um, as has been said before, it's a fully accredited degree. It's a normal BSc ONS, um, uh, and they can specialise in any of the pathways that we offer. Um, the way it's assessed is exactly the same as any other degree that we assess. So typically there will be two assessments per unit, sometimes there'll only be one, um, and they do 12 <coughs> units. So it, in university speak, that's uh, 12 lots of 30 credits, which is 360 credits, which is what a degree in the UK is defined as. The difference is that the assessments are, are tailored where we can to the workplace. So um, this is how it's structured. And what you'll see here is the core units at the top, which form the, the, the kind of the fundamentals that we build everything on, stuff about business systems, programming, web development, computing fundamentals. Everybody does that. Everybody does technology management. And those five things, I think, um, form the kind of core of the, the degree. They learn about programming and web and under computing fundamentals, they do databases and networks and a bit of security. In technology management, they do project management, service management, um, and a little bit of the legal stuff associated with technology management. The synoptic project and the portfolio and the elective are the things that sort of happen towards the end of the degree um, where they're allowed to specialise and, and also um, develop their own interests. The portfolio is, uh, although it's only assessed right at the end of the degree, is something they build up over the four years and that's really evidence of their behavioural skills and knowledge um, and um, is... Uh, should be based on the kind of experiences they've had at work uh, where they kind of got to evidence it and then reflect on it. And um, in the final year, they write up some entries into their portfolio about, about their professional development and about how um, their experiences have, have led them to where they've got to from four years previous when they arrived uh, innocent. Um, and um, in particular, it's also an opportunity for them to write about where they see their career going and to actually do a bit of early planning about their, their career. The specialist units um, uh, you'll see listed down below the, um, the main titles, but for software engineering, what you'll notice is there's, um, advanced programming, computer networks and operating systems and enterprise programming. Um, and for the, for the mainframe, the way that this has been implemented is that um, they all do business systems, the web development, the computing fundamentals, technology management. The introduction to programming is normally Java for our uh, apprentices, but for the mainframe people, it's COBOL. The advanced programming is normally more Java, developing um, servers and client-side applications, a bit of uh, mobile development and stuff. Um, and we're kind of negotiating and talking with Barclays um, about how we will implement advanced programming. But I know Ian wants to put some assembler in there and, and probably there's going to be more recs and, and things that I don't understand. Um, I, I find it's been quite an education of, uh, for me to find out how good my um, sort of negotiation skills are because actually I just sit there and listen to people and pick out what I think are the important bits and, and document that. Um, but while we're on that, it's important to say that this, is, this has been really an unusual and, as far as I'm concerned, unique path. Normally what happens is universities, they might have conversations with companies, but then they go away and design a degree and, and implement it and deliver it. Um, what's happened with this is we've talked with Barclays about what they want. We've looked at the outcomes of Ian's special interest group. Um, and then we've tried to adapt the, the offering that we've got to take on that on board. Um, but as Ian has said, this is being done in a very agile way. So I'm sure it will change next year for the first years. But also, we still haven't worked out what we're going to be doing in the second year. 
We will actually work that out in, in consultation with Ian and, and his colleagues um, uh, uh, in order to actually satisfy the requirements of the apprenticeship, but also to deliver what Barclays think they need out of these apprentices. Um, so it's, it's, that's quite an unusual pathway. That's not how it normally happens in the development and delivery of a degree. Um, and as the, has been mentioned before, um, Barclays are actually also helping in the delivery in the classroom. So um, currently our first years come in on Mondays and we actually have three, as, as Elaine will explain, three Barclays uh, staff come in to support the students in their COBOL development. So it's got lo lots of unusual um, aspects to this mainframe and I'd be interested to hear if any questions you've got about that. So that's what it looks like, um, and really it's just giving you a bit more detail on the slide previously. Um, but what you'll notice here is these two, to be confirmed, they are not quite an open book, but they're certainly to be developed and designed. Um, and I can come back to that if, if you like. But uh, I don't want to spend too much time talking about the detail of, of the, what we teach. Assessment is, as I said, we are structured such that we have 12 units that they teach, 12 modules, if you like. Um, and each of those has usually two assessments, unless it's a project. Um, and where possible, those assessments are work-based. What we've done that's unusual, I think, is that we have... Um, under our exam regulations, the, the um, ability to tailor any of the assessments. So typically what will happen is a tutor will write an assessment for their particular unit and will give it out to, to the apprentices or the students. Um, in the case of our apprenticeships, what can then happen is the, the apprentice can take it home and we encourage them to talk about it and share it with their line manager and their mentors. But then if, they, if there's a... a strong similarity or, or um, a kind of overlap between something that the apprentices are doing in work. It's up perfectly okay for the line manager to, to write to the unit leader and to say, well, you want them to, to build this database on this you know, scenario case study that you've given them, but actually they're, building, they're doing some database work at work. We'd like them to do this piece that they're actually going to have to do at work anyway um, and offer this as an alternative assessment and although we've not had huge numbers of that I think it's a real strength because what it allows is it allows us to use a piece of work that was going to happen in the workplace anyway to be assessed um, as part of their degree and to deliver it and as long as it achieves the learning outcomes that we have defined that's entirely possible. So that gives a, a, a dimension in a way of making it more based on the workplace. As I said, some of the, the more discursive assessments that we give them are asking them to go into the workplace and to write about that. Um, as an example, um, I teach the technology management unit and uh, currently I've got the apprentices going into the workplace to, to look at a project that's going on in the workplace and for them to write about that and evaluate it and analyse it in terms of how that whether it's using best practice, whether it worked, if it worked and it's not using best practice, why, how did that happen? Um, and to, to kind of do some seriously critical thinking about what's going on uh, in terms of that and make some recommendations if they can. But inevitably, in order to do that sort of work, they've got to, to be able to be writing about stuff that's really going on in the workplace, and that inevitably raises issues with confidentiality. Um, so we've got a um, number of things in place in order to ensure that we um, can protect the work that an apprentice submits to us. Um, we can put a cover sheet on it, a standard declaration form that, that just... Uh, instructs the tutor to be careful with it. We've got a, an NDA which we can get signed if we want further assurances. Or for some of our apprentices who are actually working under um, Official Secrets Act, it, it comes down to the fact that we would actually go into the workplace because the work can't actually leave the premises. That's not happened yet, but we know that there are some of the engineering companies we work with are, are doing defence work. It's not clear <clears throat> to new companies 
um, what the role of the, 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 the companies and the, the staff in the companies are. And, and the apprentices will tell you their kind of version of it. But the ex there's an expectation that the, somebody in the company, the line manager, will be uh, monitoring what's going on in, in, at the university via the apprentice on a regular basis um, and um, supporting the apprentice in terms of the, um, the work that they're doing. So, for instance, if they're doing something which requires them to go into the workplace, then that, that contact point will help them find an appropriate project or help them find uh, people to talk to about the project that they've got to investigate and write up. Um, we also encourage the line managers and mentors to read their assessments before they get handed in so that they can make an assessment about whether there's anything confidential in them that needs to be um, treated specially. Um, and we have uh, three or maybe four, depending on the, the situation, um, visits to the apprentices with, where we've got an employee liaison tutor and they go in and talk to the apprentice with their line manager to review progress at work and within the university. which is that. Um, and we find that's a really useful thing to do, that review, because it, 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 it unearths all sorts of um, issues between the company and, and ourselves and any, any problems that the apprentice is likely to be having. Um, and it supports the, it involves the, the, the company and the line manager in the, the degree in a formal way and helps them to understand what's what's going on and, and what we're trying to achieve. I've got some slides here which I'm going to skip through very quickly on ePortfolios. We use some, a, a piece of software called OneFile um, which we use to support the apprentices evidencing their behavioural um, outcomes, i.e. what they're doing at work which um, maps onto the apprenticeship standard in behavioural terms. Um, we can also use that to record attendance and things like that. And I'm going to hand over to Elaine. Hello, I'm Elaine Duffin. Um, I was a mainframe analyst programmer until the summer of 2010. Um, after that, I went back to university to do a master's degree and then a PhD and have been working at Manchester Met for about two years now. Um, I had thought that my mainframe days were over <laughs> until I heard about um, this plan to get a, a mainframe focus to, to the degree apprenticeship and so what I want to talk to you about is what we've done to, to sort of tailor the introduction to programming to allow it to be delivered through mainframe COBOL. So when we're teaching a unit at university we have to look at what the outcomes are going to be, the measurable outcomes. Now at Manchester Met the outcome for the, the outcomes for the programming unit did not specify what language or system we learn it through. So it's perfectly okay to teach to the same learning outcomes with a different language or environment. As Robin's all also shown you already, the, the outcomes specified by digital and technology solutions, they also don't specify what platform or what language you're, you're going to produce code on. And then there was a working group that Ian chairs from GSE who created a list of proposed outcomes for a mainframe apprentice. So we're... And that does very specifically mention mainframe skills, techniques, technologies, languages. Um, and that clearly mentions COBOL as well as many other technologies. So it was about getting to, together a, a unit that we could teach that's mainframe, relate, mainframe COBOL related. So... Obviously, being at a university, we didn't have access to a mainframe. So one thing that we, had, we found out was that IBM have a lot of initiatives to encourage training and the spread of mainframe skills. And so we've used materials from IBM Academic Initiative 
and IBM Master the Mainframe, which anyone who's not a student can still sign up to the learning system to use the materials and facilities, which means that for the first time in seven years, I'd got a mainframe ID and password, and I could actually get onto a mainframe um, to, to start to refresh some of my skills. Now, for our main teaching, we use Zeus. So IBM have a mainframe that they call Z Systems Europe um, University System, and that's the one we it's uh, the one we use for our teaching of mainframe. So we've we've all got ideas and that all on there now. So, and then, of course, if we're going to teach mainframe COBOL, we can't really teach mainframe COBOL unless the, the um, students also know some other mainframe backgrounds because the, you, we're, gonna, we're using ISPF, we've got to look at our jobs on SDSF, we've got to be able to submit jobs, so we need some JCL. Now, for, for this year, those background topics were covered for the apprentices in-house by their employer, Barclays, which was really good because the first time they came to university they could all already navigate their way around ISPF, they could copy, create content, copy content um, uh, and things like that. So, um, so this was the sort of screen all of a sudden familiar to me from several years ago. And, and when I show other students who, who are on the full-time program, they say, oh, but you navigate it so quickly. And it, it just, after, after a gap, it feels like home and it feels really safe compared to other, other systems. So from, from the list of learning outcomes, we had to break it down into a number of topics, basic topics on COBOL programming. Now, we did this in very close consultation with staff from Barclays, so that the, the sort of order of topics and the progression is, is um, appropriate for their needs and fits in, so that it is an integrated apprenticeship, not a sort of separate, here's your COBOL training at university, it's somehow different from your COBOL that you do at work. Um, so th there's a list of, of basic topics that, that we're covering during the first year, which would be familiar to, to many people. Um, some of those are familiar to people learning any programming language. So how do we present that um, content to the students? Well, the very first week they came, they had a boot camp that was um, three days of very intense sessions um, with quite a lot of content, a lot of work. Um, but the, the general pattern that the apprentices take is to attend every Monday. Um, they come in and they have a two hour COBOL programming lab every Monday. And we're supported in the lab uh, there's a rotor of staff who come from Barclays to support those labs, talk the students, uh, allow the students to discuss what they've got so far, any issues they're having, their approaches to problem solving, their understanding of how things relate to each other, how they're going to use their JCL um, to run their programs. So it's been really valuable that we've had that input from Barclays and this year, all the apprentices taking this um, path, mainframe pathway are from Barclays. We do a mixture of exercises. Sometimes they're business style exercises where we're, anal uh, we're reporting on, on data. And sometimes we do more programming puzzle types of things where we look at puzzles that are available on Rosetta Code and try and solve the puzzles and then have a look at answers that have already been submitted. So as, as Robin said, assessment is obviously an important part of uh, any university course. So 
um, within the COBOL, the introduction to programming using COBOL, we have two main assessments, but one of those is a portfolio, so it is built of a, a number of tasks. And that includes programming tasks, um, multiple choice, a couple of in-class tests that will be on code reading and the ability to interpret code from the written code, as well as the students keeping a log of the skills that they've been learning um, as they go along. There is a larger coursework um, that's written, but the students haven't yet seen it, um, which is a business-style scenario. Um, rather bizarre, it's a home shopping scenario, given my background. Um, and they, they'll be assessed on design, code, and test. So within our introduction to programming at Manchester Met, there's a lot of emphasis on the design aspect. So quite often, so when I was a, a trainee in, in industry, we started off for a very long time. We worked programming from very detailed specifications, and we gradually moved into some analysis and design. We're with this degree part of it, it means that the students are getting the chance to try out design in a sort of safe environment. So they can, they can develop skills in designing a solution to a problem, but without it being critical or, you know, the, the being able to show a range of skills with, without it being critical as to where they are with that. Um, necessarily um, so as so rather than just assessing the code and the quality of the code we're looking at how they justify how what design decisions um, they've made right so that was my brief introduction to how we've tailored the the course to um, the mainframe pathway yes yeah, uh, we think that there is we have a Another person who'd like to present an alternative. No, 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 just, just, uh, just a footnote. Uh, okay. The, so, so Herb, they've taken a different approach. Slightly. Slightly. And, and I think, yeah, just to give, again, a bit more of a context, I mean, we want to, to build on what we've done with MMU. Um, you know, it's great, it works for us. It's local, you know, we have to have a, a universe that's local to us because... The guys are working one day at university, four days in the workplace, so it has to be local based. Um, we see that as we, as we evolve this, there will be potentially free hubs. Um, I've had, I'm in conversations with a couple of other financial institutions that, that are north of the border, are looking at doing something within Edinburgh. We've got some conversations going about how we get uh, uh, the equivalent of the MMU in Edinburgh um, involved in this stuff and, and Herb's looking from a, I suppose, the, the southeast of the, the area. So I'll, I'll hand over now to, to Herb to do this side. Hello. Uh, brief aside. Uh, I'm Herb Lee. I'm a More. Fingers crossed. Yeah, do we have to go VGA? Proper old school. Just, uh, uh, let me just speak um, uh, generally and frankly. Uh, so, uh, is, as you may recall if you were here last year, uh, we, we started with the intention of um, taking advantage of this, this new 
policy innovation, which was the, uh, the apprenticeship levy. And um, thinking of ways that the mainframe community could deal with some of the problems that we've had over the past 20 years or so in terms of staffing, in terms of development, uh, and, and benefit from this new, this new available resource. Uh, so uh, we, we, we had a timeline, we organized a number of, uh, of meetings, and we thought of a number of ways that we might um, uh, organize the, uh, the, the courses. Um, at, at some point, we said to ourselves, what's the best way to uh, make this available uh, as, as quickly as possible? And what are the things that need to happen in order to make it um, valuable to uh, the mainframe community? At this point, we came up with uh, a, set of, a set of points, a set of um, um, learning outcomes that would be mainframe uh, specific. Uh, so, in, in, terms of, in terms of making it a reality, um, we uh, set off on a number of different paths to, uh, to, to climb the, the wonderful hill of, uh, of user university approvals. Uh, and uh, and this, this led us in, in two different directions. Uh, so, we approved uh, a, a program which, um, I mean, in essence, most undergraduate computing programs are broadly similar, and, and that's, a, that's a function of how we, we all work together. Uh, we're, we're kind of external examiners for each other, and we have kind of core things that everybody needs to know. Uh, our way of, uh, of looking at it was really about taking some of our existing programs and seeing what were kind of the mainframe equivalents. So if you can imagine how you might kind of go through a menu and go, hmm, uh, you know, how can we make a how can we make a vegetarian version of uh, of Masaka? Say, uh, it was a very very similar process where we kind of looked at all the units that we had and said, okay, so uh, on this unit we use Python. Uh, what what's what would be our mainframe Python? And and Rex was was the we, the, the kind of the, the solution that we we came up with. Um, we we also tried to put in a few very specific uh, mainframe. Uh, units which would encompass not just the things that people were using every day, but the things that we might like to see. So some of the stuff we talk about new technologies, uh, stuff about um, Z Linux, uh, stuff about uh, blockchain, that we'd have a couple of specific units where we only looked at, at Z technologies. And in that respect, it was, it was broadly similar to, uh, to what we um, what we've what we've already seen. So it's ba based on the based on the same standard, um, uh, and just just slightly different uh, approaches uh, here and there. Uh, we we're hoping more broadly that this would be a community of practice. Uh, I have an agreement from um, uh, Darren at uh, at uh, uh, Manchester Metropolitan to be one of the external examiners on uh, on our courses. And, uh, and so we look forward to, uh, to growing the, uh, the national community of, uh, of mainframe, uh, well, new, new starters on the platform uh, as, we, as we go. So, um, shame about my lovely graphics. I, I, I'd have never stayed up so late if I, <laughs> I had a name. Um, but yeah, bro broadly by and large, that, that, that's the story. Um, uh, have a look at our Dalek. He has an email address on him apprenticeships at beds.ac.uk. If that's something that you're interested in talking about, then do, do let us know and let's, let's have a chat. But, uh, but um, by and large, um, you know, we, we, we look forward to, uh, to developing the, the programs and the, uh, and the community. Mm -hmm. right. So I guess, really, questions for, for us or for her, if you've got questions you want to direct at him. Um, what question? What, what didn't we tell you? We are preaching to the converted, maybe. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Just out of interest, what do you think of the helmet that had for this event? So it was originally approved in block mode. Right. Uh, though, so we approved all our DTS together. So, uh, so Matt may have a, a kind of length of experience of running it a couple of years. Uh, we were just putting all of ours in place uh, at the same time. Uh, we have one running, which is not mainframe, which is a one-day-a-week model. 
but we originally approved it as for a 30 credit module or unit, that would be two weeks worth of block mode and kind of tasks that you're doing in between. Hi. How are you recruiting students to join the apprenticeship program next year and then the year after that? So what are you doing to recruit? Well, the, the, the glib answer is nothing. And then as much as we could put responsibility onto employers to do it. Having said that, we organise open evenings uh, to spread the word to schools and colleges, to tutors and, and parents. Um, and for, certainly for smaller companies, we've organised assessment days to support them in the recruitment process. Because unlike Barclays, there are, there are quite small organisations there who really don't have the experience or the, or the kind of uh, resource to actually do that. But yes, um, and, and we have, we do a lot of marketing. People um, sign up on our website, so any student can sign up and express interest, and then we just we will feed them with um, details about any of our employers offer, who are offering jobs. So there's a kind of a, a, a pipeline there out to, to people that, that come across our website. But for, for, for big companies, they're a better attraction than we are. Um, so. Um, you might want to say a little bit, Ian, about how Barclays handles that. I don't know. Okay, and we've already got one. Who's <laughs> <laughs> very keen. Um, yeah, I mean, d these guys at the front are going to help to do that. You heard the feedback um, from the first session where, where I went home and cried to a mum um, about being put into Mayfair on the first day. And, and that's so they're going to help, they're going to get into the schools. They're going to start to, to, to promote this opportunity, which, which we have, which then should start to produce people like yourself that, that actually come to us and say, oh, this is the career and this is what I actually want to do. At the moment, we just, people just don't know it's out there and we need to promote it and say, what a good opportunity this is and, and that's what you're going to help us with, isn't it? That's the other thing that we do on our open evenings. I mean, we get large numbers coming in, um, but um, the people who really sell it are the apprentice ambassadors, who we get a bunch of them to come and say, like these guys have done today, what, what the experience has been like, um, but also then we have a panel whereby people in the audience can just ask some questions. And, uh, yeah, it's, um, that's, that's a very effective way of, of conveying what, what it's like. Um, so in terms of the main customers, you reached out to all of them. Yeah. So, so, so without naming names, um, <laughs> there's active conversations going on with with a bank, uh, or two banks that are primarily based in Edinburgh, and we're looking to get an Edinburgh-based um, university because you know they do use it. One of them does use MMU already, but it, it makes more sense for them to, to do that. Um, we've got BT represented here. They were, uh, we were very close to the apprenticeship program, um, and it's, it's what we're trying to do as part of a GSC group is to help companies to, I suppose, have them conversations with our senior management, with our HR departments, to, 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 to get it better known that, that this is something that we need to do. We know in Barclays, and we've got your support, so we're very lucky in that we, we know this is a problem, it's going to be here for some time. I've had a conversation with, with another company um, whose HR department was, was actually saying, well, we can't just have these as mainframe people, that's unfair on them because it won't be here for much longer, so you've got to teach them two things at the same time. And we need to get that, they need to get that message across to, to the people that are making um, decisions on that. And I'm trying to get, um, we've got, we're having lunch afterwards, is to get IBM more involved in this stuff, because to me, if we can get the might of IBM behind this, you know, this is a sort of model which we could use globally in my mind. There's no reason why I can't use this in the US. I have conversations with US banks who say the same as us, what are you doing? Isn't that really good? So but there's, there's opportunities all over the place. Well, we've got 150 in the first year of MMU, so we've got 
200, over 250 uh, on the program at the moment. We don't see that number going down next year. It could even go up. Um, but, but it's a capacity issue for us because, you know, we just don't necessarily have the staff and the rooms to, to kind of grow that quickly at the moment. So we're probably going to have to cap it. I'm sure Herb will have similar success stories. I mean, you know, there's, there's a lot of, there's a growing number of apprentices. It's growing very rapidly. Yeah, so the, the levy kicked in in April. Uh, so the company started having the money taken off them. And they were very frantic thinking about ways to, to spend it on their MP level people. Uh, so as that really starts to bite, they have two years to spend it, otherwise it disappears. Uh, so, so we anticipate uh, ever increasing interest. Uh, so we, we have, originally we thought about running this as a trailblazer group, which is a way of creating a completely new standard. And for that you need 12 core members. So we, we do have, you know, on, on board to, to be with, we have you know, the, the big manufacturers and software and users and, and, and vendors. So um, th th there's, a, there's a core of people who've expressed an interest, which hopefully means that we can spread the message throughout the industry. And we've got some quite ambitious plans as part of GSC, so we want to have a master's version of this as well, which we discussed last year, because A, it gives you another career path, another career, but also for existing staff, I think that would be really good recognition if you've got somebody who's been here for a very long time and you're able to assess them and you'll be able to give them a master's um, degree, is it a master's degree? Yeah. In, in, in mainframe is really great recognition because we can do certification, but it's, it's a mainframe thing, it doesn't transfer. A master's degree is a master's degree. So, so we are looking to how we continuously um, evolve this as well. Master was baking in the idea that they're also communicating and working with the apprentices, so yeah. we can actually tie the two together. How easy is it to find the specialist technical skills within the academic community to deliver these specific courses? <laughs> <laughs> you, you found them. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not it. <laughs> Elaine's it. Um, it's it's tricky, really tricky. I mean, you know, I I did computer science at university in went in 1978, and I didn't even do COBOL then. You know, it's just not been a sexy subject for universities. They're not interested in COBOL. Um, <laughs> uh, so. Um, you know, there, there isn't a lot of expertise. Having said that, you know, there's a lot of stuff that translates. So we teach SQL, you know, DB2, it's based on SQL. It's, so, you know, we can teach core stuff that then very quickly gets generalized and can be used. You know, we teach about Linux, okay, it's a much slightly different flavor that you're gonna be using on the mainframe, but that's, you know. There's lots of stuff that is, we do have the ex expertise, is that it's the development pathways where it's tricky for us and we've got lucky that we've got Elaine um, but conversation that, that we need to have with Ian and Mike and, and other people at Barclays is how we do that second level development stuff and what goes in there. I'll, I'll let you add to that. I mean the truth is that it's, it's not really, you know, you're not supposed to be an expert exactly in what you're doing, you're really kind of framing the learning and helping people learn. So in the four days a week that they're practicing, that's where most of the learning happens and part of the support system. And in a way, you have an interest in it, you have a good understanding of it, and you're basically helping to frame their learning. So sometimes you hear these conversations and they go, oh well, but they must be you know, a mainframe guru, otherwise how could they touch a mainframe? And well, that's not true. Uh, very, very quickly, um, you know, students take part in something like Master the Mainframe, they get a reasonably good understanding of something like you know, kind of JCL and, you know, kind of Omnib and stuff like that. So I think one of the things that we're trying to do is, is take it away from being, it's only experts who can touch the mainframe, and say, oh, come on, dive in, make the most of it. Make the most of the knowledge that's around you. Yeah, I think we put a lot of barriers in place. You know, we, we see ourselves as being different and special, and but there's lots of just stuff that transfers. COBOL is programming at the end of the day, you know? Yeah. Yeah. How do you see, I mean, I've, I've been, I finished about a year ago, City Group, and I've watched the exodus of, like, core mainframe jobs to the Far East. How do you see this, and, and to be honest, 
uh, from a personal perspective, the, the level of code, application design, the whole thing was just really watered down and shoddy. It was gradually going that way when I left them. How do you see this sort of uh, redressing that balance? Do you see this stemming that tide of, of throwing it to the, to the <laughs> 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 I, well, hopefully. I mean, I, you know, I mean, that's, that is the whole tenant that, that, that the apprenticeships is based on is, is to kind of, you know, fill the skills gap. And, and you know, mainframe is just about as well-defined skill gap as, you, you, as we probably can find. So, yeah, hopefully that is. That and, uh, you know, OK, 20 in the first year is not a huge number, but it's, it's a start. And it's a, it's a healthy and substantial start. Yeah. So I would hope so, yeah. But how long that takes, I don't know. Do you have a yeah. feel for that? I mean, it is, it is a UK government who's basically, that is presumably the agenda, is to try and stem that and to, to create, you know, skills within um, the UK. Um, it's, I mean, it's very strategic within, within Barclays. Um, we do have other locations, but the UK is, is as equal um, strategic as strategically as any other location um, and, and we definitely see particularly within areas like mainframe we see a lot of value in having the, the IP in-house um, because that's where you get this I mean it was interesting when we did the first presentations um, from, from you three that we was able to see a level of stewardship already developing and a level of caring wanting to do more than just just the job and to me, that's what comes from, from this sort of stuff as well. So, presumably, you know, and, and the other companies that I talk to are definitely looking at the UK. So, in a way, what we're trying to do, I suppose, what, we're, what should, we should achieve here is we'll start to create some sort of a momentum where companies will start to say, actually, we can do this really good um, within the UK as well. I think the chair's been really remiss. We're about to get shooed out of this room, I think. Um, <laughs> yeah. So uh, I think we should probably wrap this up. Thank you very much for, for coming. Um, and uh, if any of you want to talk about coming and doing, getting sh people into apprenticeship with you, uh, my colleague Hayley is here, who's kind of, will, um, is a business development manager for the apprenticeship, and she'd be very happy to talk to you. Thanks. Okay, thank, thank you very you much. To, to Robin, Elaine, and Herb as well. So <laughs>